Okay, so as promised, we've got our, our Q&A uh, session, and we have the time available until uh, about 10 to 12. So that should give uh, opportunity both uh, for questions uh, or indeed uh, comments. And um, as, as before, we would ask you just to uh, give your name and affiliation. And also, I've been reminded of people facing the front when speaking to uh, uh, to speak up, please. So, have we got anybody who would like to ask first question? First one, the second row. Um, thank you for really interesting presentations and with um, the University of Salford. Um, I'm really interested that um, in the Tottenham Court Road um, refurbishments, every time I come down to London I see a bit more screen done, I'm wondering how much of the new technology that you've been talking about will be available in that tube station and that part of the hub? Um, I think our plan is to put the Wi-Fi in all stations um, as we get the money and are rolling it out. I don't know if it will be in there as soon as um, Tottenham House is in the space. Um, Andrew. Andrew Evans, Imperial College. I, I, I'd like to address a question to uh, to um, Dr. Elster. It seems to me you were downplaying the role of the department in promoting a new regime, for example, for road use. When if, if these new technology comes on and we don't have to drive in the same way as we do at the moment, that will completely change the whole legal system under which the roads are used. And unless the department is kind of in the lead and thinking about that, nobody else is. Yeah, I, I, I hope I, I'm, I'm disappointed if I gave that impression. I mean, there is a role definitely for the department in things like that that run at, at, at sit at that top yeah. level. And as I said, we are doing some work now to look at what those implications all are. Um, what the technology is and how it's rolled out uh, and how it's developed is uh, the market is driving that very much. Yeah. But you're right; if it won't happen, it's not the technology that's stopping it from happening. It's the the, the policy and the issues around insurance and safety and licensing and so forth that are real challenges. And that's definitely an area where we need to be on the front foot. If you look at the U.S. and what Google have been doing in the U.S., where they've just been driving the car and then saying, "Actually, we've been driving the car. Uh, see, it's safe." Um, what, how can you stop us from, from using it normally? We don't want to be in that kind of same kind of situation. We want to be proactive about this. And the UK, I think, is in a good place on that. Uh, but it is very complex. So, but we are working through it now. So, yes, that is one area that I think we are uh, that I will, uh, at least on the curve with, if not the curve. Are you happy with the answer? Well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's through Okay, some of the answers I've Robin. Robin Hickman from UCL. Uh, a question maybe for the two governmental bodies. How can we try to ensure that the, the use and development of digital technologies is better matched to societal goals, which I think at the moment is it's not fabulously well. Going good I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, 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 that is a real challenge, particularly because um, a lot of the things I talked about um, has crossed so many different areas of responsibility. So, um, if you look at the, uh, the graphs that we saw about the, the morning and afternoon peak demand on TFL's mm -hmm. transport network, you see that on, on most transport networks, and that's what we're, we're kind of having to support because you have to support those peaks, not the average. Um, requirements over the day. If people stop going to the office at 9 o'clock every morning and going home at 5, then that smooths that out for us, but that's not really a transport-owned um, problem, but I mean, it's not transport that will drive that, it's other things that will drive that. And I think the take-up of digital technologies has got to be really driven by a, a business kind of need and a business uh, and providing uh, organisations with the uh, the, the staff that they need to do their jobs, and that may be sitting in a cafe in King's 
across, or it may be going into the office every day. Um, but I think there is a need for government to kind of have a coherent view across how that is changing things. Um, we do have cross governmental horizon scanning um, teams that look across the different angles of all the different departments on how some of this digital agenda may affect how departments need to do their business and how they need to provide the kind of services they need to provide to, to the public. But it's a very complicated issue. Yeah, I think I agree. It's kind of a almost a three-way issue, it's understanding what the business needs are, it's understanding what the data or the digital technology can do and then how we do it. And I think it's probably, it is a very iterative process of us all kind of working together and all looking in different areas. And I think like as you said, with the working from home, we're working from a different place agenda. It won't be transport can't deliver that, but we need to start looking at other industries to see where there are overlaps with the questions or the problems we're trying to solve and see if we can all work together on it. So just continuing this uh, interaction between digital technologies, digital society, if you like, and um, um, and real life. Um, well, I think all of you, even if you didn't use the phrase personal data, we're, we're talking about ap applications which involve the use of uh, personal data. So my, my question would be then, um, it, it, does this mean that um, privacy is is dead? Uh, far from it. Um, privacy, I think, is it, key to a lot of this stuff. Um, I must admit, I do worry when we start putting all these data sets together. It's very easy to um, <coughs> the analytics that we've got to what you think is anonymous data in one case. When you add it to another bit of data and another data set, actually, it's quite easy to work out who the pieces of information are referring to. So, and there's a lot of work going on to try and come up with new ways of doing privacy. Um, but I think it's important. But I, I also think it's interesting to s understand people's attitudes to it. So um, people of my generation, or, or maybe it's just me, um, I don't have a lot of photos on Facebook. I don't kind of expose my life on the internet. Whereas a lot of, uh, of younger generations, the students in these kind of places, they live on the internet and it's all there, and they, do they know that it's there for good and it's very difficult to remove at the moment? I know there are, again, work going on to, to provide those kind of services. And are people comfortable with that? Do people know how the data that they provide to, to their support, <coughs> their, uh, their loyalty card gets used? Do they mind? I don't know. So I think there's a broader debate about what level of privacy do people want and expect? What are they willing to sacrifice to get services provided, you know, personalised services provided to them? Um, certainly from a government perspective, data that we hold that is, um, a, there are big privacy issues in making sure that we don't, don't contravene what we need. Yeah, John? Yeah. Um, yes, and um, um, well, I'd like to make uh, two brief points. One is that um, even partial data can be very useful. For example, um, if uh, in dense traffic, a few people would volunteer this information, mm -hmm. we could actually know about this traffic. And so we don't actually need everyone contributing to it. Secondly, um, uh, data is personal property. So actually, you need to recognize actually that's a bad form uh, uh, property. So the probably the best uh, analogy is blood. So, but uh, actually, uh, the society only works actually uh, some uh, because some actually the babies work. Uh, but actually, we need to actually have very clear rules uh, and respect uh, of uh, people who actually donate this data for whatever societal uh, purposes. And uh, some of that uh, people brag about, and actually, including some of the data I show. And uh, uh, in that context, actually, uh, anyone who's read uh, today's Metro newspaper. Actually, we know that uh, today is the eighth uh, anniversary of uh, Twitter, the launch of Twitter. And uh, actually, the um, in the short period, actually, there's a huge amount of change. So, I'm very hopeful. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we will do. I think we need the people who are um, like John is very skeptical about. Um, the use of this data and also um, the level of privacy that people want and expect. And we need to really, as we're um, analysts and researchers, 
not to get excited about, oh, we could do this, but actually think, is there a benefit to it? Is it really useful? What are the pros and cons? And I think we've got to constantly, as we're going down all this, look at this new bit of technology and what it could do. Is it really right to be doing it? And there's a real benefit. Um, I think something we've got to think about as we keep going. I presume the John you referred to was John Polak. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Ben. Um, we'll yes, Ben, ben Heider here, yeah. UCL. Uh, I think the perspective we've heard so far is rather one of management, and uh, I would like to emphasize the user's perspective. Now, we have a certain amount of infrastructure, and I think, Miles, you, you quoted a figure, cars are used roughly 6% of the time. Uh, they, they are lasting increasing lengths of time, and yet technology is improving ever more rapidly. This leaves us with an antiquated fleet. Uh, we, if we could increase the density of use of cars, we could shorten their lives and turn them over faster, uh, redu reduce the um, investment in cars. Uh, perhaps motor manufacturers wouldn't appreciate that. But uh, we could reduce the capital tied up in the car fleet beneficial. Now, um, how could that happen? By making use of data uh, by allowing travellers better use of data through car clubs, um, build the picture that a car will be available when it's required at higher marginal cost but lower capital cost. And that will emphasise use of public transport. Now, um, that is a particular example of how information can be, can be used beneficially for the user and in ways that will benefit society at large. I think there will be many other ways in which the amounts of information that are available can be used uh, to help us get better use out of uh, the roads, the railway network, uh, all the other infrastructure that we're investing in. I don't know whether that was a question or a comment. <laughs> it was, it's, it's a comment, perhaps inviting responses. Um, I mean, I think, okay, I don't know how accurate that 6% number is or how, how wide it is, but it's I mean, high. It's, sorry? It's high. Okay, 4%, I put also. <laughs> okay. um, so, but I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a shocking number. Uh, and I think I, I mentioned about car clubs and business models and, and shared ownership schemes and so forth. It is quite interesting, I think, um, about how people perceive the pay, how they pay for their transport. Um, just talk about mobility as a service, and you'll just you know, you, you pay a monthly fee, and you'll have mobility provided for you whatever you need. And kind of TfL do a, put a lot of that in, in, in London. I have an Oyster card, which is a top page you go on, and I just pay as much as I need to, to get the tra access to the transport that I that I want. It's quite interesting when people people don't think about cars in that same way. They don't quite realise the cost of having a car sitting on the driver 94, 96 percent of the time that they're insuring and taxing and, and it's depreciating in value. But if you hire a car for the week, it costs you, oh sorry, for the weekend, it costs you 56 pounds. But that's a cost now. It's not a, a hidden cost. And how we can change that perception of, of, of how it all works, I think, is an interesting one. Though, I, I draw the, the parallel with the computer games industry these days. It's coming from, you don't buy the game, you pay for kind of things during the game. And if people are beginning to see that as a viable way of doing it, you move from a capital to a capex to an opex kind of model, which companies understand, but probably individuals don't necessarily. I think it will drive some of those, those kind of behaviours, particularly in big cities. Um, and you're right, that it's a win-win for everybody. And data is an enabler of that, but I think there's a lot of other barriers that need to get across before it can happen. Can I briefly yeah. say that uh, uh, transport is that um, and dimensional optimization. Um, it's very difficult. Um, I tend to uh, see that the uh, opportunity is to sidestep uh, the question about uh, how much the car is used by looking at the wider lifestyles. For example, um, people now actually in the dense urban areas as the data start to show, actually uh, it's made it uh, uh, both people uh, it made, made people happier and also use less car. They may still have the car, and actually the car use statistic will be even worse. <coughs> um, because uh, if you say that uh, 
that people use a one hour a day maximum. So 23 hours a day the car is, is parked. Uh, so, so, but in Japan, actually, four weekdays are parked as well. So it's only one hour of the weekend. Um, but um, that's a decision they can make. So we all have uh, these uh, things actually in our box room that we don't use. Um, <coughs> and, but uh, the, the, the point really is to do with uh, the wider lifestyle question, which is the question that uh, I think both uh, speakers here have mentioned as well, uh, of looking at uh, uh, how to coordinate uh, with other changes. <coughs> Okay, I'll take one more question. Uh, John Evans, Windsor Line pa Passengers Association. Um, <coughs> our members living outside the TFL area at the moment need two tickets to commit radio to commute regularly to work. Um, they need a ticket operated offered by a train operating company and an Oyster card. Um, with the introduction of Crossrail. Uh, Network Alliance tells us that the Oyster card will have to go in the next six years to be replaced by one of the systems currently used by train operating companies or out of London bus companies. This seems quite shocking, but is it true? I haven't heard anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not um, fully up to speed with all the smart ticketing work that's happening, but I know there's there's, there's trials in the south southeast, and, and there are discussions about how you can move to having a single ticket um, in that, that situation. Um, it's a lot more complex than you think it would be, um, and not the technology has some complexities to it, but it's more around um, kind of commercial business integration side that, that adds the complexities. But I know that the, the departments have got a lot of work in that space to say I'm not. Thank you. Okay, I'm under strict instruction to, uh, uh, to keep us to time. So uh, just before we uh, uh, thank our uh, morning speakers once again, uh, the arrangements for lunch, we have a uh, 60 minute lunch break. We make our way to the uh, lower ground floor. I recommend using the stairs, uh, probably. Uh, and there's a, a cordoned area Right, so please could everyone be back at 10 to 1 for a top start and can we thank our three speakers once again.